If you've got a Bible, if you'd go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Peter. Uh, we finished 1 Peter not that long ago, and so we're going to go ahead and continue on to 2 Peter. Um, they share a lot of similarities, since they're both written by Peter, that tends to happen, um, but they have some different themes and different um, focuses. Where 1 Peter is primarily focused on living in exile, and so a lot of the book is about suffering and perseverance and getting through the struggle of the hardship of life. Um, 2 Peter is a little more positive, a little more encouraging. Um, here he is a lot more focused on growing in our sanctification and growing in our faith. We'll also touch a little bit on false prophets next week in chapter 2, and then we'll talk about the return of Jesus and the day of the Lord. Um, in chapter 3. And so I thought this book would be good for us to study next since we just did First Peter and we talked so much about the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. Um, it felt like all three of these books kind of go together well. But this morning we're just going to look at chapter 1 and here he's going to be talking about what it means to grow in our godliness. And the primary phrase that I want us to kind of latch on to and to be thinking about as we do this is this idea that we are partakers of the divine nature. And so Peter has a different way to talk about what does it mean to grow in grace and to grow in our faith. And as he talks about it, he says, we are literally partaking in the divine nature of God. And so my hope is that as we read this chapter this morning, that it'll really help us maybe um, have a different view and a different idea of what it means to grow in grace. And so if you are able, if you would stand with me um, for the reading of God's Word in 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll read the whole chapter. And so Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own great glory and excellence, by which He has granted us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world because of sinful desire. And for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Through them, you know and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I am in the body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made very clear to me. I'll make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths. We made known to you to the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received the honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of God, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you. I ask um, that your Holy Spirit would continue to speak through the word that you have just read and that you would speak through me. Help us to behold your glory and to partake of you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Um, our first point in your bulletins, if you're taking notes, if you haven't guessed it already, is that we should partake of the divine nature. Um, to partake of the divine nature. Part of sanctification is not just getting a little bit better. 
being better today than you were yesterday. Sanctification is not only just being conformed in the image of Jesus. Sanctification doesn't just mean that we are becoming more holy as we ascend and become more truly ourselves as God made us to be. It means those things, but part of what sanctification also means is that we get to partake in the nature of God. I've got to do some setup before we talk more about what that means in verse 1 again. Simon Peter, servant apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by righteousness of our God and Savior. So you can notice who this letter is going to here. His focus isn't on those who are living in exile. because Here, his focus is more broad, just those who are believers, who are, have faith in God, because anyone who has faith and comes to Jesus, anyone who trusts in Jesus alone for salvation, is on equal standing, even with apostles like Peter, the chief apostle. Not through our own works, not through our own ability, but through the righteousness of of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is part of what it means that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. It was not only to give us forgiveness, but it was to give us righteousness so that we now can be declared righteous before God. And if you've put your faith in Jesus, in the eyes of God, you are as holy and as righteous and on the same standing as Peter and Paul and James and John. Not because of what you have done today, but because of what Jesus did yesterday by the righteousness of our God. Two, may the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. This is not just a generic greeting that everybody does. Peter is asking and hoping and praying that grace and peace and that the knowledge of God would be multiplied in our lives. This may have been a hard season recently for some of you, but he still calls for our grace and peace to be multiplied. Has your grace for others been multiplied? Has the peace in your heart been multiplied? Are you growing in your sanctification? Because we should be. And three, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us in His own glory and excellence. Look at what we have been given. If you've put your faith in Jesus, we've been given everything that we need, all things. All things that pertain to life and to godliness. What does it mean? It means that God has given you every single thing that you need to live a godly life. God has given you every single thing that you need in order to follow Jesus. God has given you all that you need to be a Christian in this life. And all of this, it comes, He's granted all things through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. There's two different Greek words for knowledge that are primarily used. The one that He's using here is talking about relational knowledge. Knowledge that comes... Um, Not just because we know something about God, not just because we've intellectually learned some facts about Him, we've learned His attributes and memorized some acronyms, but because we have put our faith in a God that we know and that we trust and that we believe. It's the kind of knowledge that you would use to say that you know your family. The way that you would say, I know my wife, I know my husband, I know my kids. That is the kind of knowledge that we are to have of God. And so the God who is giving us all of these things has called us to His own glory and His own excellence because knowing God in this way should change everything. And sometimes when we talk about, um, when we talk about God's glory and God's excellence, some preachers can almost make it seem as if God is like self-centered and it's just all about Him, even though it, it rightly can be. But we need to see, too, is that God calls us and He invites us to participate and to share in His glory. And we get to share in His excellence. He shares it with us even though He doesn't have to and even though He does not owe it to us. He chooses to. For by which He has granted us His precious and very great promises. God has granted us these incredible promises. Think of some of the great promises of God, the promise that He will never leave us. Promise that He will forgive our every sin we've committed in the past, present, or future. The promise He will be with us to the end of the age. The promise that His love for us is steadfast. The promise that even when we are faithless, He will be faithful. The promise that He will return and come back. The promise that He will not leave our bodies to rot in the grave, but that we will be resurrected. The promise that after our death, we get to go and be with Jesus. These are great promises. And our God keeps His promise. And so that through these, through these promises, through everything that God has given us, we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So here's the key. We get to partake of the divine nature. Now, this doesn't mean that we are becoming God. 
It's not um, a kind of process where we're overtaking God or we're all becoming our own individual gods, but we are being transformed to being like God, truly. You see, the new creation we sang about when I'm making you a new creation, I'm taking out your heart of stone, I'm giving you a new heart, I'm making you new. It's not just a fresh start on our old nature. Now we get to have, what is this new nature? Part of it is a divine nature. And it's really thinking about this, I mean, it should change and help us in the way we think about sanctification. It's not just trying to get a little better, it's not just working on ourselves. It is a glorious privilege that we get to participate in what it means to be like God. It is a blessing and it is a privilege. And this participation, when we partake of this divine nature, when we are growing in our faith and we're no longer being controlled by our sinful desires, yes, they still remain and we can feel the pull and the tug of sin, but it no longer holds us in its chains. Now we're free to say no. Now we're free to resist and go a different way. I'll tell you, it may seem small and minor, but I don't know, thinking about um, sanctification in this way and just getting to participate in the divine nature has been life-giving for me. Um, And seeing it's not just that we're giving a new nature, we are given the nature of Christ. Part of what does it mean to be in Christ? It means this. It's also helped me to see, too, um, sanctification isn't just something that happens. It's not just something that we do. There is something profoundly mysterious, profoundly divine and mystical about it. That we're getting to participate in the divine nature of God. We should do that. That's point number one. Part number two is we need to partake in sanctification. To partake in sanctification. Because we've been given this incredible gift, because we are getting to participate in the divine nature of Christ and God, we need to use it. Okay, we can't act like children who neglect a great gift given to them by their parents. They get an awesome toy and they just don't want to play with it. They want to play with a box instead or play with some sticks outside. Okay, it's funny, it's cute, it's adorable when they're little and when it's Christmas. When we act like that, it is rebellious against God who has given us incredible gifts and has given us all things. And we decide, ah, no, I don't really need that. I think I can do this myself. That's not cute anymore. So how are we to use it? How do we partake in this? Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. For this reason, we have to make effort to supplement our faith with virtue. It continues on. But there's a couple things I want you to notice here. First, partaking in the divine nature, partaking in sanctification, following Jesus, takes work. It's work. Christianity is not meant to be approached with this lazy, like, hey, I prayed a prayer, gave my life to Jesus, I've been baptized, I grew up a Christian, gave my life to Him once, I, I'm good. I'm just going to do what I want to do now. No, because of the gospel, because of the salvation that we've received through Jesus, we are to make every effort. We should be working actively. And we are to supplement our faith. There might be, well, what does that mean? Because it, makes it could, might make it sound like our faith is insufficient. As if, wow, that's really nice that you came to put your faith in Jesus, but you need more. It's not that. Our faith is the foundation to our lives, but the faith is the starting point. You actually have to, okay, we we put our faith in Jesus, we put our trust in Jesus, and then once we begin there, we move from that faith and we continue to grow in that faith and sanctification. And God will show it, and Peter will show us here different ways practically of what that can look like. But none of these things will make any sense without a foundation of putting your faith in Jesus. You can do all of the right things. You can outwardly have all the the values of a supposed Judeo-Christian Christianity. But if you do all of that, if you think all of the right things, but you don't have any true faith in Jesus, it does not matter. And it's not worth anything. But we, so we do need to make sure we're not getting it backwards. Faith is the foundation. Do not try to build a house on sand. Um, but if you have a firm foundation, don't quit. Build something on it. Okay? If, otherwise, the Christian life is just an empty slab of concrete. You might say, hey, come over, look at my house. And we go, oh, this looks like a nice start. But where's the house? You're missing something. And so that's why we have to make every effort to supplement our faith with virtue. So we supplement our faith with virtue. Part of our efforts is virtue. Virtue is one of this forgotten idea in our age. Virtue is our character. 
a character that's revealed in our actions, like our honesty, our humility, our kindness, our integrity. And our faith, it should come out in our actions as we grow. And one of the things that happens as we participate in sanctification, as we participate in the divine nature, is we grow in our virtue, and with virtue, with knowledge. So as we grow in virtue, we also need to be growing in knowledge. This is the other word for knowledge. This is not just growing in a relational knowledge of Jesus and of God, though we need to do that too. It's growing in our intellectual knowledge. And part of how we grow and part of how we participate in sanctification is we're continually trying to learn more about God. We want to learn more about Him today than we knew yesterday. We shouldn't be content with what we know about God. We should be wanting to know more. What would it look like if in, in our relationships if we say, oh, you know what, I think I know enough about my wife. I don't think I need to like, learn anything new about her or pay any more attention. I think I've got it. I'm good. That would be a problem. Okay, but we need to do the same thing with God. We should be wanting to learn more. Listen, I put a lot of time and effort into studying God's Word every single week. Okay, I'm trying to learn the Greek and the Hebrew. I'm often poring over church history, reading through the ancient believers. What, what do they see? I'm us- these passages, I've usually read them over and over. Sometimes I've read them for weeks. And let me tell you, there are still times that I'll come up here and it's time to preach. And I read it all the way through as we do before. And I've read it in Greek and I've read the 17 commentaries and I've read a bunch of stuff. And there'll be something that I notice and I go, oh my gosh, I have never seen that before. How am I going to preach this thing? And I don't even know what to do with that. How did I never notice this thing? And most of the time, by the time we've gone through a book, because we go through books of the Bible, okay, by the time we've preached through all of the verses and we've had so many weeks through it, when I'm done, I feel like, okay, I think I get the book. I might be ready to preach it now. Okay, by the time you're done with Joel, we don't want to hear it again. I just now think, I think I'm ready to preach it again. I think I kind of understand it now. Now I'm ready to try and really get it. Right, because I'm trying to grow. And we should be trying to grow that way too. Whether you're preaching God's Word or not, it's we should be reading it, not thinking, okay, I've got that book, I'm done. Man, what more is there to learn about God? And our knowledge with self-control. We should grow in our self-control. We need to be in control of ourselves. I talk a lot about self-control with my young children. Okay, but we still need to work on our self-control as we get slightly older. There should be nothing that you can see that pops up on the news that makes you lose your mind. There should be nothing that happens in your day that makes you lose your control of your tongue or of how you speak, how you react. Should temptation cross your path or pop up on your screen, it shouldn't make you lose control of your desires or of your body. Our world is out of control. Our world doesn't like self-control. It doesn't value it. The value of the world is just to embrace, follow your desires, follow the desires of your heart, follow the desires of your body. And it's weird. Talk about self-control or denying yourself something. But we need to be those kinds of people who are in control because the Holy Spirit is in control of us. For what it means to be sanctified. And self-control with steadfastness. We are to be people who are steadfast. We can't be in control one day and we're out of control the next day. No, we continue. We need to be faithful. We need to stand fast in the storms and the turmoil of life. Our faith can't be wrecked and destroyed from day to day. We need to be continuing to hold fast to Him. And our steadfastness with godliness. As we grow in steadfastness, we need to be growing godliness too. Part of the holiness in this godliness is as we become more and more like God and more and more like Jesus, we are sinning less and less. We're acting more and more holy. The more we partake in sanctification, the more effort we put into sanctification, the more sanctified we should be becoming. And our godliness with brotherly affection, we should be growing in our brother and our sisterly affection that as we are participating in the divine nature of God, we do this and it helps us grow in our love for our brothers and our sisters in the faith. Not just for the ones that we agree with, not just for the ones that are in our church, not just for the ones that we like, for all those who God says are His children, we grow in our affection and our love for them, whether we would ever want to hang out with them or not. And our brotherly affection with love, and we continue to grow in love. Our love begins with our own brothers and sisters in the faith, but it can't stop there. It has to continue and spread out to everyone else. Because if we're participating in the nature of God, we are participating in the nature of love itself, and it should make us filled with more and more love. These are the things of what it means to partake in sanctification. Now, one thing I want you to see is these aren't like a progression. Okay, they're tied together, but it's not, okay, step 
one is virtue, and then step two is knowledge, and then three is self-control. So it doesn't mean, you know, hey, I'm still working on step one and two, so I don't have to worry about love right now. I can kind of do what I want. No, no, no. These are all tied together. It's a never-ending and always continuing cycle that growing in love will help you grow in virtue and growing in steadfastness will help you grow in self-control and vice versa. And there's a mysterious way that kind of all of these things happen together. And verse 8 tells us that these qualities are yours and they are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be growing in these things if we don't want to be unfruitful or we don't want to be ineffective. If you want to be an unfruitful or an ineffective follower of Jesus, don't try to grow in your faith. Maybe another way to say this, if you think that you're good and you're just going to coast and you don't need to work on your sanctification, you will stop growing. And you will stop being effective. And you will stop bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I also want you to see effectiveness and fruitfulness for a follower of Jesus. It begins and it really ends with sanctification. It's not about our ability. It's not our giftedness. It's not our talent or our charisma. It begins with following Jesus. And growing and partaking and participating and sanctification, the divine nature of God. Verse 9, forever lacks these qualities, is so nearsighted he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. One thing about this that's scary too, if you forget these, it's like we've become blind and we forgot what Jesus did on the cross. Now, he's not saying here that you've lost your salvation. What he is saying is you've forgotten your salvation. You've forgotten what God has done for you. You are living and you are acting as if Jesus didn't come down and die in order to save you from your sins. You are acting like you have spiritual amnesia and you need to remember. Verse 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your election and your calling. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Because of this, right, this should make us want to be even more diligent. What does it mean to confirm our election and confirm our calling? It means we should live like it and we should act like it. We should be making every effort to partake of God's nature. We should be making every effort to partake of sanctification because if we practice these things, if we are making all these efforts to supplement our faith, then we will grow and we won't fall. It's a wonderful promise God makes. In verse 11, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we continue practicing these things and we continue not to fall, then we get to richly enter into the eternal kingdom of Jesus. Now again, I don't think this means that we have to be practicing all of these things and you know, conquering them and doing them amazing in order to be saved. Um, we have to be at some level for our faith to actually be true and not just something we say, but something that we really believe and mean. Um, but what Peter's getting at is there's a difference between how some people are going to be welcomed into the eternal kingdom. And the scripture does at, at different moments, and Jesus says this as well, that there are different levels of rewards for those who follow Jesus. Much is given, much is required. If you are faithful with much here, then how much more in the next kingdom will you get? And so those who are faithful and who are obedient and who are not just put their faith in Jesus, but who make every effort to grow and do grow and grow greatly, they will be richly rewarded and will richly enter into the kingdom. Those who are unfaithful, that means their faith in Jesus, they're struggling, just making along, being disobedient, dragging their feet. Well, they still get to be in the kingdom. They still get to be in grace, but the rewards will not be as great. That should impact how we live. Now, we'll say on the other side, no one who will be with Jesus in heaven will be disappointed. Nobody. Even including the person who did the worst and gets the smallest reward. They will be maybe happier than all of us. But if we love Jesus, if we care about Jesus and we care about what he's asked us to do, we need to remember 
We need to put in the work. The key with all of this is, again, we have to actively partake of our sanctification, and it takes work. One of my favorite images um, that I've heard of sanctification is it's like we're trying to clear a vast wilderness and make it habitable. There's trees everywhere, there's thorns, and there's weeds, there's rocks, there's hills, there's ditches, uh, there's junk. And we've we got to make it someplace so we can build a house and we can hang out. There's going to be plenty of ups and downs. You're going to start chopping at a, a big tree of sin and think, ooh, I don't think I can handle this one right now. I'm going to have to come back to this. I'm going to have to work on something else. I think I'm going to pick these weeds over here because that's a little easier. Um, it's not easy. It'll take a long time. It'll take your whole life. And there may be some areas when Jesus comes or when you die that you haven't been able to make a lot of work in. It's okay, but hey, it, it takes effort. We've got to show up every day and we've got to go to work. Are we trying to follow Jesus actively or are we just doing our own thing and hoping Jesus is somewhere in the background? Point number three is we also need to partake in remembrance. We need to remember what we believe. We need to actively work at remembering. Um, we're gathered here this morning. We are assembled as a local body of Jesus to worship our Savior. Um, not just because we think it encourages us and gives us strength to go through the week, that that is good and that is helpful, but because we believe that these things, these words that we have read, this book that we are holding in our hands is true that it is the true word of God, that it is the words of life. Verse 12, he says, Therefore, I intend you always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth you had. Peter wants to remind us of these things. And there's a reminder, what he wants us to remember is don't forget the truth of Scripture. Remember it. And memory in the Bible, especially, memory is active. Okay, when my wife asked me, did you remember to write that check? She is not asking, did the thought Bree told you to write that check come into my brain? And I think, ooh, I should do that. And then I did nothing. She wants to know, did I remember? Oh, I'm supposed to write that check. And then I did it. That's what she's really asking. She says, do you, did you remember this? Because remembering something and then doing nothing doesn't really count. You say, oh, yes, I did remember. And then I didn't do it. Aren't you happy? No, okay, so Peter is saying, remember the truth of these things. It's not just like, oh, yeah, the Bible's true, that's nice. No, remember it and then act on it. Remember it and then do something. 13, and I think as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, he's working hard now. As he's getting older with his body, to stir up our, our memory and encourage us in 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. As our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, Peter is doing this and he's writing this. He realizes and knows his death is coming. He remembers the promise of Jesus, the end of John, that he would be murdered for his faith. He ran away from it the first time, but he will be faithful the last time. And Peter will be mur murdered for his faith. He will be crucified upside down in Rome because he tells him he, he's not worthy to die the same way as his Savior. And he knows that day is coming, and he wants to spend his last days reminding us of the truth of the gospel and the truth of Jesus. In 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you will be able at any time to recall these things. Peter's getting to the end of his life, and he's making plans. He's thinking, what is it going to be like after me? If we're lucky enough, and in God's grace, he blesses us to, to understand and to recognize that our death is imminent and that it is coming, it's coming soon, then we start making arrangements and plans before it comes. We start wanting to have those last conversations, start wanting to make decisions. This is what Peter is doing. And what he wants is he wants us to remember. He wants us to take on it, to hold on to it, to remember that everything that he wrote and that the apostles wrote and that is in the Scriptures is true and from God. 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. When we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter is saying, I did not make this up. He's saying, I'm not smart enough to make all this stuff up. I'm just an average fisherman. Didn't invent these ideas about theology. He's just telling us what Jesus told him. He says, I'm an eyewitness to the majesty of Jesus. See, the Scriptures are the very Word of God, and one of the reasons that we believe that this is the Word of God is that because the people who wrote it, they heard God. 
They witnessed God and they saw it and they tell us about his life. And at the end of his life, Peter is saying all these things are true. I saw them myself in 17. For when he, being Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Okay, Peter was with Jesus for a long time. He was with him for three years. Saw countless miracles. Heard all of the things that Jesus had to say in his teachings, many of which we might not know anything about. Sermons and teachings of Jesus we haven't hear, heard or seen. But the thing that Peter comes back to over and over again is the transfiguration. As Peter sees his end coming, that's what he keeps returning to and remembering. That moment on the holy mountain when he got to see Jesus in all of his glory. When Jesus pulled back the veil and showed not just what his human body and his human nature looked like, but what God looks like fully. When Elijah and Moses appear next to him and they start talking together in the moment when God's voice speaks and says, this is my son. In 18, he says, we ourselves, we heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the mountain. Peter's saying, I heard that voice. I was with him in that place. I heard it shake my bones and my body. And I think the reason that he chooses this story, the reason that this is what he remembers is he knows that his death is approaching, but he knows that glory is approaching too. He knows that the Jesus that he misses and cannot wait to see, he knows exactly what that Jesus will look like in heaven and eternity because he already got a sneak peek. In 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to you, which you do well to pay attention to, as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. He wants us to pay attention. He invites us to pay attention to the prophetic words. And when he says the prophetic words here, he's not just thinking about the words from the future about the prophets, just the words in Joel and Isaiah or Ezekiel. He's thinking about all the scriptures and all of God's word, including this one as he's writing, because he knows that this is the word of God. He doesn't just think it's a letter. And he's saying, pay attention and listen and remember it, because this is the light in the darkness. If you were down in the pitch black in a deep cave, you didn't know how to find your way out, and you saw a light in the distance, you would head towards that light so you can escape. You would go to it so that you could see. Listen, this world is a very dark place, and the light of this world is Jesus. And the way that we can see the light and that we can behold the light is in His words. And we can know it and we can trust it because it's right here and it's the light that we need. And this light does not ultimately just brighten our hearts. This light can take our hearts out of the darkness to the place we need to be. In 20, knowing that first of all, no prophecy of Scripture came from someone's own interpretation, he tells us again, none of these words, none of these stories, none of these Scriptures come from somebody's opinion. And those apostles did not invent this stuff. Apostles don't have 12 different opinions or interpretations of what Jesus meant when He said, I'm the light of the world. Writers of the Bible didn't have different interpretations of what does it mean when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected. All of it, all of their words come from God and come from Jesus. In 21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They wrote these things through the Holy Spirit, and there really is a sense they're just kind of like carried along. They're vessels um, for what God was doing and what God was writing. Yes, they're participating in it um, somehow, but there's this mysterious nature about it. But ultimately, it's the Word of God. I love this section of the, of the chapter. Um, it encourages me, strengthens me to remember, and helps me remember and realize that the words that we have received, the words about Jesus are true and they are trustworthy. So one of the reasons um, I love studying the patristics, I love studying the early church, as many of you have figured out if you haven't already, or you wonder, I don't know why. Well, over and over, the reason I love it is because it shows the Bible is true. The Bible is true. The apostles really did write this. The church really did believe this. This is what Christians have always thought since Jesus came. And it helps me remember. Peter wants us to remember. And as we remember, as we remember the truth of what we believe, it will sanctify us. As we partake in our sanctification, as we partake in the divine nature of God, part of this too is um, 
That's why so often I pray after I read God's Word before I preach that God's Word will change us, that it will sanctify us, that we won't stay the same after we leave. Because it's not enough just to see the light of God's Word. We need to let it change us. We need to partake. We need to partake in the divine nature. We need to partake in sanctification. And we need to partake in remembrance. And if we do those things, it can change everything. Let me pray for us. Invite our worship team to, to come up one more time. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us, Lord. Help us to see you, to behold you in your Word. Lord, help your Holy Spirit to come and to help us, to guide us. Lord, would you strengthen and would you encourage us? Would you confirm our calling? Would you confirm our election? Would you help us in our sanctification? Lord, so I, I confess that often I can be lazy in my following of you. There are days and there are moments I just go through the motions. Lord, would you help us to not do that? Would you forgive us for the times we do do that? Lord, would you come and strengthen us and help us make every effort to build on that firm foundation of our faith in you. Would you continue to change us as this wonderful, blessed mystery as we get to participate in the divine nature. We pray this in the name, above all names, in the true name that is our only hope, the beloved Son of God. Amen. Would you stand as we worship our Savior through song one more time? Right. Hear this benediction from the end of 2 Corinthians 13. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. Go in peace. <laughs>